would like to welcome our hosts or our uh, panelists, uh, Alan Ark, Howard Chorney, Lee Copeland, and Anna Roisman. They will be um, sharing a lot of their ideas and thoughts on the latest trends in software quality based on their experience and uh, happenings in the industry. So let's move on. Uh, firstly, a little bit about PNSQC. We are the oldest um, software quality conference in North America, and the, the whole organization is run by volunteers like myself that help to promote the conference as well as um, promote software quality. Um, and what we do is we have a conference once a year, and what makes this conference a little bit unique is that the speakers actually submit papers rather than just a PPT. And so that makes it uh, kind of like a, a hybrid between an academic conference and a commercial conference. Um, there's a big range of topics and speakers, just like all the other software quality conferences. And there's a heavy focus on um, hands-on experience and sharing um, uh, problems and how you solve those problems. As far as topics go, we have a really wide range of topics here. I won't read through them, but uh, you can see them here. And the webinar will be recorded as well as the slides shared on uh, SlideShare. Also, feel free to ask any questions throughout the webinar as the speakers are um, sharing their ideas. Uh, they'll be more than welcome to answer any questions and I'll moderate that, those questions. Um, this is me here. Um, you'll note the most important thing probably at the bottom where it says that the abstracts are due on April 10th. And you can uh, find us on Twitter and online and so forth. Uh, you can see our, our hashtag. And OK, so welcome to our speakers. Um, let's see what they have to say. Here we go. Alan, uh, you're up. Alan is uh, one of the is an expert in uh, automated testing, and especially with Selenium. And he's presented several times at our conference, and uh, has really put out some good papers. Um, Alan, why don't you share some of the things that you think are the latest things that are happening in uh, software quality from your point of view? Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, as you mentioned, I do see a lot of automation talk out there in the wild. I know I am in Portland, Oregon and a lot of the job posting we have in our area have to do with people who want to do QA but really want to live in the automated testing side of the house. And some of the tools that you know, we're looking for at EID and other places as well would be Selenium for anything web facing. Um, also Angular and its testing tool called Protractor is another hot spot. Uh, Angular 2, I guess there is some discussion about which particular version, uh, what type of tools are going to be used as compared to Angular 1. So that's always kind of neat. Uh, another trend that we see here is the blurring of the roles in, with Dev and QA and Agile. Uh, but what's something I, I do want to talk about is one of the reasons why we are having this webinar today is to help drum up support for people just wanting to turn in an abstract and maybe make a presentation at PNSQC. And it's really a lot of fun. Uh, the biggest thing I always tell people when they have an idea for a presentation is I tell them go with their gut. Present an idea that really resonates with them and it'll come out in the presentation. Even if you don't think that there's a large audience for your particular topic, put it out there and see what other people think of it. Uh, I would say that the committee itself for vetting the abstracts and the papers is pretty diverse and if they see a diamond in the rough they're more than able to and they will tell you, hey, you should pursue this. Take a look at this. And don't let the requirement for a paper discourage you. It's actually not that bad. You do have a lot of support uh, among the team. You're going to have someone, you're going to have multiple reviewers of your paper. Uh, they're really good about giving you feedback uh, and ways to improve the paper. 
and it's really not as daunting as the task may seem. Uh, right now, I am I have a paper submitted through Better Software West. I'll be presenting in Vegas, and it was a case study of something that I accomplished here at EID. And that, that's actually a pretty common theme at PNSQC. People present projects that they've worked on, want to present lessons learned where other groups might be able to benefit, and you have a, ch a really good chance to network with the authors and people just in your field. It's a cozy conference. It's not super large. Uh, everybody at PNSQC I have found to be very friendly. And in all, it's just a great place to go. Even if you do not present, should check it out uh, as an attendee. It really is a lot of fun. Alan, uh, you mentioned uh, one of those tools other than Selenium. I, I'm getting old, so I can't remember. It started with an A, or I can't remember. What was the name yeah, of it? Yeah, AngularJS. It's a is framework. That a, uh, is, is that an open source framework? Yes, it is. Uh, it's really uh, to all your normal uh, test automation challenges when running from UI. Things change. People don't put IDs on HTML elements. Um, but those things you can address as a team, working directly with e developers. Just kind of tell them, hey, if you don't put names or IDs on these elements and they move around, everything's going to break, and then regression testing turns into a nightmare. So uh, it's really just, just setting up that expectation among the team members and talking to developers, or sometimes even going through and adding those elements uh, on your own. Mm -hmm. So if you were to, say, submit a paper on, on that, on Angular, what kind of different uh, aspects would you be thinking about? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, right now, at my work, only certain teams are using Angular. Uh, I have not had a ton of experience with it, but I would imagine that if a person is working with Angular and Protractor, they can just kind of talk about their experiences, and I think that will help the, the group at large. Hmm. Okay. And how about Selenium? Is there anything new in Selenium these days that people are embarking on as ways of solving some of those problems that you mentioned? I would say that right now I'm a little bit lax with uh, my involvement with Selenium. Uh, currently in my project at work I am doing a lot of Windows Presentation Foundations uh, app automation. So I'm kinda sad that I'm not in Selenium but I'm happy in that I'm learning something new. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, all right, then. Well, um, if you're finished, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker, um, which I guess that would be uh, Howard. Are you ready to go, Howard? Here you go. Howard is um, I sh the I sure technical director at Dosta, and um, he's been in the industry for many, many years. I won't say how many years, because um, I don't want to tell everyone how old Howard is. But uh, Howard, why don't you take it away? Um, let you go. Sure thing. Thanks, Phil. So, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Much appreciated and happy everyone's interested to hear what we have to say. Um, I'd like to start off by actually reflecting on something that Alan said earlier, um, which is about writing the paper. So, you know, writing a paper sounds scary at first, but it's really not that scary, and actually, I think it's an advantage just to going off and doing a PowerPoint deck, because if you write a paper, you actually have something to model your deck on top of. So I highly encourage people to go ahead and do write the paper. You know, Phil alluded to, I've been in, in the industry um, for a long time, which I have, and I can actually remember when we used to go to conferences earlier on, we were all required to write papers before we... Um, before we could even present. I mean, they'd, they'd basically pick you on your paper, so highly encourage everybody. It's it's not that scary. Um, you, it's amazing on how much you know or how much you, you know, when you get going on it. It's like the paper just flows and it's only a five pager so it's not that big of a deal. So I'm here today to talk about um, performance topics that, you know, people will like to cover. I'm a, on the performance engineering side and I do mean performance engineering and that's kind of like I think a really interesting segue into you know topics to think about. So in today's performance world, um, 
Again, that performance needs to start at the beginning of the process and work its way all the way through. So one really important factor to remember um, in thinking about a paper is it, it's okay to write um, perform about moving performance to the left, okay? Uh, doing a lot of work. One, you know, one idea would be, and Phil, it's cool if I talk about ideas, right? That's right. That's what we're here for. All right. Just double checking, my friend. Um, you know, one idea is there are a lot of very cool code perform code review tools out there, and a lot of these uh, tools have rules written towards performance. And you know, it's been my experience, especially over the last few years, that I've worked with um, development organizations in implementing these tools and seeing some of the wonderful results that we get out of the tools because you're actually checking your code for performance before it even goes out into the build. So, you know, that's one really interesting area to work in, and I think that's pretty hot from an industry perspective. Um, you know, another general one is just the different tools you use to, um, to actually run your performance test. There's a whole array of things out there. Naturally, I'm from Sosta, so I'm pretty pro cloud test from that perspective. But, you know, there's a ton of great stuff. And, of course, you know, there's the other tools, which I won't mention. But anyways, you all know what they are. And, you know, there's a lot of interesting problems that have been solved and challenges that actually come up when using these tools. So, you know, there could be another kind of topic, as Alan was alluding to before. It's kind of interesting to, you know, come up with a case study of a problem and how you resolve it. Definitely a lot you can do on the performance and from that perspective, you know, another area that's really huge in performance is um, analysis and reporting when you actually get into, you know, after you run your test and have to kind of analyze what's going on so you can feed the results back to everybody. I mean, there's a whole, a whole plethora of topics you can do just on the analysis piece alone. And not only that, but the tools that you use to do analysis. There's a lot of industry tools out there. We're probably all using them. And, you know, there's another great area to kind of work into. And while I'm rambling on about these areas, you know, another thing that's getting really huge in the industry, especially if you work on, you know, I work on e-commerce websites. That's sort of where my I've migrated to right now. And it's a multi, multi billion dollar industry. And you could actually talk about a real user monitor on that thing. And that's really a major problem today with an e commerce. If, um, really, a for website on the initial. Load. It's taking too long to load. Have people leaving, so it's really, And then from there, what you want to do is, you know, there's there. Actually, there are natural things people are going to do on your site. These are all the things that you need to discover to build your workload model and have all these script. And then what you'll do is develop all these scripts that are in parallel. So that's mm. kind of work. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm not making up stuff I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Did you have anything anything else to share in the performance testing area that you thought would be good ideas for um, for abstract? Actually, I see another for ideas for mo you know moving ideas to the left or moving to the left. What's that mean? Mm -hmm. Basically, what it means trying to code at it is it's and the way to do that is through proper design. And as performance engineers, I think it's kind of our to work with the developer community and help them with that. So, you know, how do you do that? You need it. always nice to know some of the performance technique. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what moving to the left means. Performance optimized so you don't actually uh, to doesn't work. Now, One of my favorite things is my, one of my favorite little is Rule, rule of thumb number one: If you allocate a resource, <laughs> all right, I will. I think I'll be there anyway. Um, now we're we've finished CH and now we're on to CO. So here we are with. Uh, we'll let uh, Lee Copeland take it away. Everybody, I think, knows Lee. Lee is with SQE. He's been there for a long time. He's a 
he speaks at a lot of conferences, um, and he's also written a book on the on test design. So, um, Lee, we'll let you go. Thanks, Phil. Appreciate it. Um, I've been asked to uh, give some advice of ideas that might be worthy of consideration as uh, presentations. And I agree with what uh, Alan said uh, initially. He said, uh, go with your gut. Uh, the advice that I give to people is uh, talk about or propose things you're passionate about and things you're knowledgeable about. Um, those uh, seem to me the, the two key ingredients. Uh, another question you might ask yourself is, what would I like to hear about if I were a delegate at the conference? Uh, what would I be interested in hearing about? Oh, I see that uh, Phil has this uh, picture of me. He's uh, apparently rummaged through my scrapbook. And uh, this is what I looked like a couple of years ago, back about when the dinosaurs lived and dirt was invented. So some important topics, things that I would like to hear about at a conference. I'd like to hear about testers' challenges with being agile rather than just doing agile. I see so many organizations that uh, have adopted the ceremonies, but they don't really understand the philosophy. They don't really, they, they never really try to figure out why they're doing agile in the first place other than it's the popular buzzword and it's the bandwagon to be on. So, uh, I'd like to hear about testers' experiences with actually being agile. Uh, second uh, idea is uh, usability. Usability is a big buzzword these days. And how to design for usability is one thing, but uh, I'd like to hear about uh, testers' experience with usability. How do, you, how do you test for it? Seems to be kind of a vague term, and yet uh, testers, you know, the key to testing is to compare what is with what ought to be. And uh, how do you define what usability is? How do you test for it? I'd like to hear about that. On the front end, uh, these days, mobile and wearable platforms are big things. So uh, I'd like to hear what the new testing problems are. Uh, what's different in testing mobile and wearable? And, uh, and what's the same also? Are there new tools? Are there new techniques? What should we be doing there? And then on the back end of systems, we've got the cloud. And so again, the question is, how do we design systems to run on the cloud? How do we test for it? Are there specific test cases that we have in cloud-based systems that we just don't have anywhere else? So I'd like to hear about that. Uh, the next item on my list is the whole lean startup cycle. Lean startups are, uh, you know, again, a big, uh, bandwagon these days uh, with the, the build, measure, and learn cycle. And so the question is, what's the tester's role in that? It, it seems that in many lean startups, they're running so fast that uh, the testers just get left out. So I'd like to hear what uh, testers think about uh, lean startup cycle and their role in it. How can they contribute? Another idea is creating your own personal brand. Uh, back when I took a business law class, I learned one of my favorite words, and that's fungible. Fungible just means basically you can't tell one thing from another. Uh, grains of wheat are fungible. Uh, uh, grains of sugar are fungible. It um, doesn't really matter which ones you use. And we as testers don't want to be that way. We, we don't want to just be just like every other tester. We need our own personal brand. So I'd like to hear stories about how people have done that, how they've created their brand and what that means to them. Working on integrated teams. The, uh, the days of silos and walls are long gone. We need to work with each other. And so I'd like to hear about testers' experiences there, especially in you know building trust where in the past we've had these silos and walls, how do they how do they tear those down and, and work together? Another key idea that's going around these days, big thing, is privacy and security. So again, how do we design for that? Especially, how do we test for those things? What does all that mean? Uh, DevOps, of course, is a big thing. 
And so what does that really mean from a tester's point of view? Uh, I keep hearing testers tell me how the, the DevOps movement is, is leaving them in the dust. And it strikes me that uh, testing in QA is a key part of DevOps. So you know, I, I don't understand how they're being left behind. So I'd like to hear stories about that. Um, not, to, not to rile anybody up, but there are a couple of words like certification and ISO standards that uh, certainly um, get people going these days. And, you know, everybody has an opinion, you know, at least one. Some have multiple opinions. But no one seems to have any data. So I would love to hear a, a paper on um, the effect that certification has had on an organization or the effect that adopting a standard has had. You know, what, what was the situation before? What's the situation after? Did we get better? Did we get worse? Did we get better in some substantial way? Well, that's about a list of uh, 10 or so items that I think would make good papers. I certainly would come to a conference and hear about these kinds of things, and uh, hope you would too. Hope those are some good ideas for you. They're, they're great. Um, Phil? The, a question came in for you here. They're wondering uh, what you mean by being agile. Well, um, Agile is more than just you know having a stand-up meeting and and writing requirements on story cards. Agile changes if it's if it's truly implemented well. It changes the entire organization. It changes the way uh, people work. It changes the the job titles. It changes the management style. Um, and. Uh, Yet I, I see so many organizations that are just stuck at the at the ceremony part. You know, they, they, they do the ceremonies, but they're not really sure why they're doing it and what benefit they're supposed to get. And so uh, that's that's what I mean by being agile rather than uh, you know just doing the agile ceremonies. Mm -hmm. What is um, it you're trying to accomplish? You know, organization wide. What what are you what are you trying to uh, to gain from being agile, other than just you know being able to have that buzzword on your your desk or your door? Yeah, I think you're right. A lot of organizations just tend to move towards agile and don't really even know why. Um, it's kind of unfortunate. Um, that one more question came in for you, Lee. They were asking about um, you mentioned wearables, and there were the question was, do you think that um, moving in that direction and understanding how um, how they work and so forth, is that something that testers are going to be required to do? Well, certainly not all testers will be required to do that, but this is going to be a, a new field. I, I just saw um, the other day, uh, not wearable, but swallowable. That is a pill with some microelectronics inside it that you swallow and it goes through the digestive tract and and uh, sends out telemetry data. Um, th this stuff is going to be big, and I don't think we have a clue how big it's going to be. Um, but you know, not not all testers have to learn about that. But if you do, then you're in a niche where again you're not fungible. You're not just like every other tester. You've you've got a personal brand. You've got something that you can sell about yourself that nobody else has. So I think it's a thing that you ought to look into. Yeah, I mean, I would say if you're an expert on testing swallables, that would make you pretty unique, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would. <laughs> okay. Um, well, thanks a lot, Lee. Um, really appreciate all your ideas here. Um, I guess we'll go on to the next uh, panelist, and that will be Anna Roisman. Um, and Hi. Anna is one of those from the Context Driven School, and she's been a tester for quite a while, as you can see. She's I've met. Anna at many conferences where she's been a speaker and her room is always full so we'll let Anna take it away. Hi, do you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me to this uh, panel and um, when I go to conferences usually what I'm looking for and what I get exp inspired from is when the testers tell um, the audience about their leadership experience. Um, there is a lot of inconsistencies in the world of software development. 
and there is always new ideas, and there is always new challenges, and there is always those reworks, and somebody wants to change the organization because this new cool idea came in. And sometimes testers being left behind, but sometimes they take charge. They take charge in changing things. And this is something that I want to hear. Those are the experiences. How did you change um, your environment? How did you change your team? How did you make your whole team care about quality? How do you make him care about good process? How do you make him work together well with the testers? And um, there is probably a lot of stories that we don't hear um, a lot because uh, those are unique. And when a person has this unique experience, they sometimes think, oh, well, it's just I've been lucky. But what I want really to hear is when this person comes in front of the group, even if it's a unique experience, there is a lot of to learn from. And we all will benefit from success stories of our peers when they change the company, their team for the better. There is another thing that um, I'm being involved on in several different associations, uh, testing association, which is testers learning and education. And a lot of testers learning has to do with um, their own passion for it. So um, it's not Mm, there is a lot of information on the web. There is a lot of fake information on the web. And there is a lot of, um, I would say, uh, fake standards that some people kind of stick to and that they decide this is it. We know what testing is and they don't change for 20 years. And I've seen those people. And I don't believe that it's right for testers to be this way, because there is always something new coming in. There is always something um, um, different. For example, um, new buzzwords, Lean Kanban, right? To somebody, it's a buzzword. But to somebody, it's an organization which is taking a very unique way of doing things. And um, how do you fit into that? DevOps, same, right? Somebody comes hmm. Looks like Anna got cut off there. Um, Anna, are you there? Okay, well, I guess we'll <coughs> we'll move on to some other parts, and if uh, Anna comes back, we can let her keep talking. Um, now it's uh, my part here, and... Uh, Lee, um, this is me. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen the movie called Benjamin Button, but I just keep getting younger and younger. Is that the way that works? Yeah, that's the way it works. <laughs> so this is me today, and the next time you see me, I'll be a baby. All right. <laughs> uh, I think most of the folks have already covered, they already did my job as far as uh, talking about submitting a paper and an abstract. and um, So... Um, Basically, all it takes is a paragraph Hi. or two for. Oh, <laughs> Hi, I'm so you're back. back. Okay, yeah. well, we'll, we'll go. <laughs> we'll go back then, Anna. Why don't you um, finish up what you were going to be? You were talking about some of the issues yeah. that, that yeah. you see. Yeah. So yeah. So one of the issues I see is that people kind of stuck in their roles and as they know them for 20 years, and there is something new coming in. For example, new processes and new buzzwords. And when somebody kind of dumps it on you and say, well, there is no role for tester, for example, in this uh, new framework, you, the tester, have to learn what this framework is about. You have to learn what value it adds, why the company is doing it, and you have to be in front of the team and helping the team adapt it or help the team to learn how to work in it. So you cannot be... Um, on the receiving side anymore. The testers have to know all those new things that's coming. And that's can why you, I think Can that you share an example maybe of uh, in the pa yeah, your past experience absolutely. on some new yeah, concept absolutely. or buzzword or whatever? Sure. Okay. So uh, one of the things with um, uh, Lean and Kanban, for example, which is becoming a new, 
it's coming it's coming as a new agile for example um I've been a reviewer on Agile 2015 conference and uh, in one of the trucks. And uh, it's a lean enterprise truck. So I have a lot of um, uh, submissions. And Agile 2015 is like the largest Agile conference. And I would say like half of the submissions were about Lean and Kanban, which is a different process from Agile, but it's becoming a mainstream. And, and test, we testers, we have to be prepared for something like that. You have to be on top of everything, every new thing that's coming in. Because otherwise you will be left behind. Because um, a lot of those things are being developed as we speak. For example, when Agile started, the idea was that they don't need no testers. Why? Because the Agile community was built mostly of developers. And they kind of assume that the way they work together is fine until, uh, through trial and error, the testers found their role in the Agile. Now new things coming in. Now DevOps coming in. Same thing. I'm seeing the same pattern. Because nobody knows how the testers fit in, they decide that they don't need it. So the testers need to be uh, part of the conversation when some processes like that being adopted. Plus, they have to explain what value they add to any process. So you have to be on top of all of that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Okay. I, I think that if uh, if people are perfect, then there's no reason to have testers then, right? Um, and I <laughs> you'll be amazed. Any new shiny thing coming in, they saying that, yeah, you don't need X because we're all going to be perfect but that's yeah. not the reality and another thing that I'm I'm seeing a lot with every new thing coming in everybody thinks that they are expert in everything right now and I'm not sure why is that I think it's the ignorance but I'm seeing the trend so mm -hmm. the testers they need to be able to fight back they need to be able to keep the conversation going right you know? well, you because otherwise Kanban. yeah you mentioned yeah. that Kanban was becoming a big deal, and I'm wondering to myself, um, what are some of the issues with Kanban uh, related to QA that um, we, we need to be aware of and that possibly would be good topics for papers? Um, I think that people who are learning to use the process mm -hmm. and applying it for their work. For example, when I was... Um, um, my team uh, of testers was working with developers, and the developers was, uh, were on a sprint, two-week sprint. But the testers' tasks were not around the sprint, because sometimes you have production issue, and you have to spend time on that. And sometimes you have uh, an automation overhaul, and you need to spend time on that. And so... Um, our QA tasks were not fit well into the sprints. Because, you know, sprints have cadence, certain cadence. Mm -hmm. The Kanban has, like, right here, right now, just-in-time tasks. What I noticed in a QA world, that our priorities change daily. And it was not the same for developers. So it wasn't really easy for us to fit into the two-week sprint because my priority changed daily. So I created the Kanban board, and it was a separate process for testers, and there was a separate process for developers. But it gave us a lot of flexibility, because we could be um, prioritizing our today's task to help developers, to help production, to help something else. You know, there is a lot. There is a lot of different things that we do environments, mm -hmm. and and that process really um, helped us to be efficient not being a bottleneck and being efficient and be very visible of what we do every day. So this is my experience. I would love to hear somebody else's. Okay, great. Well, thanks mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. um, Anna. Sure. Um, so we're going to move on now. And uh, like I was saying earlier, somebody already, you guys have already covered my part in submitting an abstract and so okay. forth. And um, this is what I look like now, and I'm getting younger and younger, as you can see. <laughs> 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit about an abstract. Really, it's just a paragraph or two. Um, and as you've heard from our panel here, it's really a great opportunity to uh, get some public speaking experience and share some of your experience in solving problems. Um, uh, we have a wide range of topics that you could submit an abstract for, as well as uh, some of the great ideas that we've heard today. I hope that you've gotten some good ideas. Um, uh, we certainly have tossed around quite a few here. Um, writing an abstract uh, is real basic. You just It's basically following the, the same thing that we've learned uh, in elementary school in terms of why and what and how. Um, and uh, you know, you upload your abstract to a, a page there. You can see the link. Like I said earlier, this uh, slide deck will be available as well as the recording, so you can go back and take a look at it. Um, and most importantly, I think uh, you know the audience at PNSQC is really hands-on, so they really want to um, hear your ideas and how you can help them solve their own problems as well. Um, lastly, uh, here's some more links for you to uh, submit your abstract, and you can take a look at this later. I won't read this off here. Um, and here are some benefits that we get as uh, speakers. The first one I'd like to mention is, of course, that you get free admission to the conference, which is really a, a cool thing and makes it easier to sell to your bosses. Uh, you know, ad admission to the conference, which I think is uh, $800 value. Um, also, you know, as an author, you get access to colleagues in terms of when you're writing a paper. Um, I think that um, Howard and Alan both mentioned that uh, when you submit your abstract, uh, you're contacted by uh, two, I guess you could say, supporters that have written papers before that actually help you step through the process of getting your your paper up to up to snuff and getting it to be really professional and thinking through the whole process and so forth. And it, as Howard said, it's really pretty easy. It's only a, a five-page requirement to write a paper. So you get all that support. Um, also, you know, at the conference, of course, you get to network with people that uh, have the same mindset as you do, and you can go talk about software quality to your heart's content. Um, and this is the last slide here. Um, abstracts are due April 10th. Um, I certainly hope that all of the attendees have gotten a good idea of what some good topics would be. Um, you can see our hashtags there if you want to um, uh, Twitter about some of the ideas and maybe get some feedback from folks. And lastly, uh, I want to really thank our panelists uh, for helping out and, and sharing their ideas. So thanks a lot, everyone, and um, have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. Goodbye.